and the deliberately provocative title, uh, I'm read, well, Traditional Pastime or Modern Menace. Um, this is not because I'm a recovering journalist and I like, I like snappy headlines. Uh, it's because we are uh, keen to try and have a conversation about essentially what's a, yeah, a political narrative uh, around gambling and the role it plays in, well, lots of our communities and uh, constituencies. But that's the, uh, so that, yeah, that title there, it's, it's there to start a conversation, hopefully. So that's what we're, we're here to do. A um, quick bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, that camera there, uh, that my colleagues are just perfecting, is going to be, if it's not already, live streaming this event uh, to the SMF's YouTube channel. Uh, I, I just say this so that when we get to questions, please bear in mind you're not just talking to the people in the room, you're also talking to everyone out there online and that the video of this session will stay online uh, forever after. Um, uh, other housekeeping, I think I'm supposed to tell you that there is no fire drill plan during this session. So in the event of bells and whistles going off, I think our fire escape is over there. Um, that's about all. I think we will. Uh, I will shortly hand over to our uh, esteemed and illustrious panel uh, for their opening contributions, and then we'll go to uh, you know, questions and discussion. Uh, so the first first contribution comes from Sir Ian Duncan Smith, who needs very little introduction. But he's easy here, uh, particularly in his capacity as chair of the <coughs> sorry, your vice. Are you vice or co-chair? Sorry, I never quite know what our title is, but uh, Karen is the chairman, and we are either deputies or vice chairman. I can't remember. Yeah. This we cover all the different parts. Deputy, and, Deputy High Grand Admiral of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of, the of, of, of the APPG for gambling related harm. Um, so yeah, 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 over to you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, James. Uh, thank you for stepping in. Um, I hope that everyone can hear me. Um, and uh, uh, I'm obviously on the All Party Parliamentary Group, uh, led uh, very well by uh, Karen and Harris. Uh, it's All Party, and uh, Richard, of course, is also party as well. So um, this is not a single party issue. This has always been a cross party and these issues are really important. The APG has done a lot of work. Uh, recently it was through the work that the APG started and then eventually brought to fruition that the fixed odds betting terminals issue was resolved. Uh, we had all the much the same complaints and rows that are going on at the moment about those are now reoccurring over the online uh, gambling issue which we are now a party to. So um, it's important, the thing that we discovered during that was that reform of the industry is absolutely vitally necessary. It extracts this industry at the moment, the more you delve into it, the more you realize that it extracts pretty much most of its profits from those who are most addicted to the process of gambling, continuous gambling. Uh, and uh, we've done a huge amount of evidence of this and we've been hugely moved obviously by the powerful work of bereaved families, and by gambling with lives and those who have uh, tragically experienced firsthand the harm the gambling causes, and it does cause significant harm uh, dealing with families who have lost uh, members of their family as a result of this, uh, and uh, uh, they cannot turn that over. And the industry constantly tells us, and we're up against it with them on this, that there should be an evidence-based review, which we called for in the first place, which the government now is going to conduct. But we already know for some of this evidence, which is really quite stark, and I just want to repeat some of this in here. We know that over 55,000 children aged between just 11 and 16 are already categorized as problem gamblers. Uh, that's 55,000 children, if you think about it, that's a pretty stark number. Uh, Heather James and all the others, and many of them who are here, I want to thank them and congratulate them for all the work that they've done uh, in this room. Uh, but they have provided some pretty strong research which they've given to the APVG and which we want to pass on. Lloyds Bank published a groundbreaking study much earlier on this year showing that um, there are one in four people are harmed by gambling. Just this week, Public Health England published yet further data on the extent of harm with gambling in England estimated to cost at least 1.27 billion. Indeed, this is, we think, a pretty conservative estimate and we need to get uh, further to the bottom of this. So not all harms uh, can actually really be costed and the true cost is probably uh, significantly higher. And I think what could be possibly more powerful evidence of the need to reform and the tragic suicides which result from uh, this gambling addiction. And we took direct evidence from uh, families that had suffered uh, uh, suicide, and it is harrowing, I have to tell you. So the industry very much goes on continuing to defend this idea that there is no need for really very much change in the way that they behave. Um, but we met the earlier on uh, this month, I think, uh, Anne Ashton, very courageous, 
whose husband Luke, and this is really quite typical of many of the stories, took his own life less than six months ago due to a spiraling gambling addiction uh, during the COVID lockdown. Uh, and so really, it's very important that you understand the human part of this as much as anything else. Uh, one of the areas that uh, we have all agreed upon, therefore, is that changes need to be made. We have set these out after a lot of detailed research. Uh, and as we see time and again, uh, we don't believe any longer that the concept of self-regulation here really works. It has to be regulation. I always want to knock on the head, by the way, that somehow we are a bunch of people who oppose gambling full stop or hate the idea of it. We don't. But what we do believe is that going back to the original uh, legislation that uh, liberated gambling completely uh, back under then a Labour government, so this covers both governments, I at the time warned personally that letting uh, it rip as they did would lead to significant harms taking place and real problems. Uh, but the government at the time went ahead with that. So this is not about anti-gambling. This is about anti the harms and making the industry face up to the challenges properly and clearly. So we do need, for example, clear affordability checks. And Paddy Power, I noticed the other day, uh, said that last month it would cap losses for under 25s by setting a threshold of 500 a month. Well, this is a good illustration of why self-regulation really won't work because um, it's far in excess of what the vast majority of young people or in fact, generally, people of any age can afford. So the threshold should be much lower at about £100 a month, something uh, I understand the SMF has already suggested as well, with checks on those who want to uh, bet more should they wish to do so. So we need to sort of get to the bottom of what is happening to those things. The area that uh, also stake limits needed online the same way as land, we need to see at least a £2 limit for addictive online slot games. And I have a personal problem with VIP rooms. Uh, the evidence that we took on VIP rooms was quite startling, really. And the idea that you offer inducements to people uh, beyond gambling, you know, uh, celebrity parties, uh, uh, tickets to various uh, sporting events, to induce people to come into these rooms and make it much easier to gamble and to gamble more. Uh, these really, I think, are invidious. And more often than not, they gamble more than they can afford. But the idea of this being something that you can, you know, play the system, beat the system, and, you know, you must be special because, you know, being invited to this room is very damaging also personally to people who have a problem. And there's very little, we think, checking taking place uh, in, other than cursory checking on who's in there. So we also think that advertising needs to be stopped. The whistle-to-whistle the -whistle TV advertising ban is fine to a degree, but it still doesn't deal with the fact that we have wall-to-wall -wall advertising in and around that period. And also, you know, the, the way in which it's advertised and the target groups that they use, the young people, etc., that they're talking to the whole time. Uh, these are areas that uh, we think need to be dealt with. If we think this is a, an industry that does create harm, and therefore we have to deal with the inducement for people to go down that road. I think Channel 4 found 700 adverts in a single game earlier this year and it just shows you this pounding incessant pounding that somehow you can beat the odds gets people to believe that somehow they're in some special business and they are themselves rather special when they take part in this so there is a desperate need to overhaul the regulatory system uh, and we need to give greater power so that the regulator has a strong oversight and the fines meted out by regulators are not just things that businesses can sort of set back and factored in by them. But there needs need to be uh, fines that deal uh, all the way up with the problems that are caused by uh, members of the industry that simply don't do the right thing on this. And I think one of the biggest areas we've seen is too often they've turned a blind eye to the sources of money uh, and to how individuals themselves have actually managed to come by money, which is completely beyond their normal incomes that they would have had. So, all I would say is in answer, and I see the polling, and I'd be interested to see later on, but I've seen it, it's quite clear to me there is no argument that somehow says this is a uh, uh, upper income groups uh, ruling uh, those who are on lower income groups. The polling shows that there's many people down in lower income groups that are very affected. And the truth is the most affected groups are in those bottom three deciles uh, of income, which is uh, where, you know, in the old days, you'd see where all the uh, all the gambling houses were, where all the shops were, the betting shops, surrounded housing estates. You know, people were encouraged to go in there, often with their paychecks or their cash in their hand in those days. And now, of course, it's moved on 
online. So it is not true that this is only a thought or a belief held by some elite group. This is held throughout by many families around the country who worry desperately about what is going on. And now the access to gambling is so much greater, so much easier, and so much more instantaneous. It therefore requires us to massively improve the regulations and the bearing of the regulator so that we can bring this back under control. It's not to ban it, but it's to regulate it properly so that we actually manage to deal with those harms and that there's money coming to those organizations that deal with those who fall out of this as a result of the harm that they and their families have felt for themselves so that we can at least get those under control. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, uh, I think you've, you've just provided a, a seamless segue into uh, for our next speaker, speaker Ray, uh, Richard Holden, who as well as being another, another office holder of the APPG, is also the Member of Parliament for North West Durham, uh, which is a, yeah, uh, the sort of place that we're, we're very interested in today, um, sort of voters we're, we're very interested in, because obviously we want, we want to know, you, uh, Richard, whether or not your, do your voters view this issue any differently to any, to any, to any others? I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a narrative, I think, that's sort of held over almost from the, from the passage of the 2005 Gambling Act that says, actually, gambling is a traditional working class pastime and that you know, the, the elites like us have no have no business trying to tell the working man how he should enjoy he, 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 should, he should spend his money at the end of the week um does that have any do you think that has any any resonance for for you and uh, your your constituents in northwest uh, i don't think particularly no uh, i think there is a, a traditional pastime in terms of gambling uh, in in many uh, constituencies across the country a lot of that's linked to horse racing uh, and uh, dog racing as well um, but the 2005 Gambling Act sort of changed all of that uh, in one fell swoop without yeah. us really knowing what we were doing at the time. I think that's now widely accepted by people who were in government at the time. that The emergence of online was never expected to, or well, it wasn't predicted in the, and it certainly wasn't regulated uh, or thought of uh, in the 2005 uh, Gambling Act in the way it was before. Um, and I just want to put this into some sort of perspective. So... Once upon a time, uh, you're, you have a sort of lower harm elements of gambling, I suppose you could say. It's things which are destination and events based. I have to go to racetrack with my friends and I can I take, I take cash with me uh, and that's the amount I can lose. Um, that's very much or, or to, uh, uh, to somewhere uh, maybe on my way to the football. That's changed, that destination and events-based gambling has switched to, uh, you've got one there, James, I've got one under there. I can now bet an unlimited amount from wherever I am on my phone. So even the even the battle that uh, Ian and colleagues had very successfully against FOBTIS has moved on. Now you've got a FOBT on your phone, essentially. Um, so what's happened is that we've, we've moved from what was a traditional pastime on a, I mean, a Saturday afternoon uh, maybe you could do, you do your sort of football accumulator uh, down at the bookies mm. um, has moved to uh, in-play betting on your mobile phone. Uh, and obviously, whenever you're in the sports betting on your phone, you constantly push towards uh, casino games, which is it's just a very different form of, of it's a very, very different form of gambling to what went before. And it's a very immediate form of gambling. And it's a very sort of unlimited form yeah. of gambling. Uh, and those are the real pressures that come on to people um, because of the, it's the speed of it. It's unregulated, uh, you know, within the, uh, in terms of how much money you can put in, essentially. Uh, and that's a, and that's a, that's a, and it's a massive concern. And particularly for constituencies like mine, because when I think of it, it's, it's um, very much cash going out of communities like mine. Because that's where the, uh, the, the the prevalence is is highest. And it's not even often retained in the UK. Uh, it does go abroad. So it's 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 essentially the ultimate leveling down. You, you've got a cash transfer out of the pockets of my constituents into uh, in, you know internationally. And I think there's a, a big debate around the cost of it. And it was great to see that report earlier this week, which Ian referenced. But I think one of the I've been trying to dig into this and try and find some numbers behind it. But there's even within the criminal justice system, there's actually no record of whether people had uh, the reason that they were committing acquisitional crime offences was due to gambling. 
Now, uh, I, you know, I know um, of uh, constituents and of uh, other people who've committed very serious and large acquisitional crime in order to fund uh, their gambling. But this has never been, this isn't recorded anywhere. We've not even got a handle on the criminal justice side on the nature of the, of, of the problem. And we've just started, as Ian said, with pretty conservative estimates to start scratching the surface on some of the health costs of it. Yeah. Um, I think we need to look at, uh, across the board, some different challenges here. Um, I want to see it. Uh, you know, I'm not a prohibitionist at all. Um, you know, I think that people uh, going uh, going go, going to the races at Sedgefield, uh, you know, near, uh, in my neighbouring uh, constituency, um, or you know, or going to the dogs, or um, going to the football. I've got no issue with people having a bit of a flutter, um, but I do have an issue when it comes to high stakes gambling. And one of the things we did recently on the Public Accounts Committee uh, was look at um, look at some of the lottery regulation. Now, back in the day, and this gives you a sort of timeline example as well, you know, uh, lottery set up 25 years ago, the average person's bought a pound ticket from a news agent. Um, that had moved to a situation where the lottery was doing instant win games uh, with 16 year olds able to bet so up to 300 the deposit and bet up to 350 pounds a week. Now you tell me which 16-year-old has a uh, has as an income, a disposable income of 350 pounds a week to bet online. And the head of the National Lottery at the time sort of prevaricated and suggested, you know, well this was fine. I think we've 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 got to see this in a in a reasonable context and what these are there for. If we're going to regulate these industries. You know, whether it's a national lottery, like it's a lottery, like you'd regulate, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the sort of conservative raffle or something like that, then that's one thing. But if they're pushing instant win games on people, then that's no longer a lottery in the same way. That's high stakes gambling, uh, especially when, and I know they've moved recently, they've moved the thing to 18, which is great. They've removed 10 pound scratch cards, which is a step in the right direction. But these are... These, these are, these, this is not traditional lottery games. And I feel everybody has been focused more and more uh, down the moving away from the destination and events to instant win, high stakes on your phone. And I think yeah. it's been quite clear that the industry isn't prepared to regulate itself. It can't really regulate itself mm -hmm. because everybody's chasing essentially what Ian said, which is the high stakes gamblers who deliver them the highest profit. Um, and I think we need to see some certain things. I think we also, in addition to what Ian said, I think we need to see an ombudsman. Yeah. There's no proper ombudsman service. My friend um, and colleague James Wilde, who's the uh, MP for Northwest Norfolk, uh, was particularly drilled down into this on the Public Accounts Committee. Um, we've got, there's no recourse. Um, it's a real problem. The stakes limits, it, why would the stakes be, uh, why would the stakes be different uh, you know, in your on your phone, which is instant access to on the high street, it doesn't make sense. Um, advertising, I mean, you know, it's there's been some there's been some progress, but it's everywhere. And I think there are some, and just finally, I think there are some crossover areas. Um, one of them is the loot boxes. Um, one of the biggest things I, I I was really surprised when I was in my constituency recently, and chatted to the uh, such as the sister of one of my new local councillors. And uh, her 14-year-old son was spending an absolute fortune on FIFA, um, basically buying um, essentially what uh, are sort of uh, the, the idea that you can sort of win, you can pay a few quid and win a sort of Ronaldo for your team. And that's the way that you get ahead. You're not really buying the computer games in the same way anymore. You're sort of, uh, it's, it's the in-game purchases. That's a really interesting area. I think it's moved from what it was when I was growing up, which is essentially a tombola, or you buy your football stickers, which you'll have swapped with your mates in the playground. It's very different if you can do that at one touch on your phone, uh, which then goes onto your phone bill or onto your sister's phone bill, as it was in the case of my constituent, and then you spend a few hundred quid very quickly. It's uh, it's a very, it's, and we need to look at that. The House of Lords has done a very interesting report on it. I think that needs to be considered as part of the broader uh, a broader thing too. Yeah.
Thank you, Richard. On, on, before I hand over to Heather, on what, one, one of your points on the criminal justice system, we, we did, because what the SMF, is, if you don't know, is we're a cross-party think tank. Um, so we actually did a similar debate to this at the Labour Party conference last week, and we had a, I think it was an assistant police and crime commissioner come to that event and say something very similar about the growing need for the criminal justice system, just, just to recognise. Just to recognise. Just to, just yeah. to recognise, collect, 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 collect later on, uh, to identify. And I, I, I suspect there is a lot of uh, a lot more progress to be made there. That feels like a coming, yeah. a coming, a coming issue. Uh, but I'm, I, I should, yeah, you don't hear from me. You don't hear from the panel. So uh, the, our next panelist, I, I hope you know, she will, will not mind me introducing her as being one of the, you know, the leading academic authorities uh, on this subject. Uh, is uh, Dr. Heather Wardle from uh, the University of Glasgow. And I think Heather, Heather, I'm right, and forgive me as an interim chair. You, you have, you have some slides to talk us through as well. Just a couple. A couple of slides. Yeah. So uh, Heather, over to you. Thank you very much. So I'm really delighted to have been asked here today to debate this issue. Um, and just before I go much further, just to put a few disclaimers and disclosures up so you can see a little bit about me. I think our previous speakers needed no introduction, but possibly uh, many of you have never heard of me or my background before. So just to say I'm a gambling academic who focuses on gambling policy and practice. I've worked in the field for over 15 years. I'm on advisory boards to the WHO. I, I've previously advised the British government and so on. Um, so I've... I've been in this for quite a long time and seeing what changes are happening and um, very interested in how we move forward and to see what reforms can, can be coming. Now, what we've seen with the Gambling Act review is that there has been intense lobbying around this on all sides. And I think it's really important whilst that's happening that we try to kind of cut through some of that lobbying and really understand what's going on with some of the figures and the data and the evidence that people are talking about. And that's what I want to try and do in this very short um, five minutes that I've been allocated. And obviously the topic of debate is around gambling and the red wall. And we've seen this as a kind of common, a common theme that other um, industries have used when they've been trying to enact uh, regulation in, in favor of public health. So if we think back to the smoke-free legislation, that was ended up being, again, the themes of kind of class war and cultural war were invoked there. And we're seeing similar things happening with gambling. And again, I, what I want to try and do is just pull us back and look at some of the actual figures, some of the facts, um, and the facts and figures that actually belie this narrative. The first thing I want to say is actually, contrary to popular belief, we aren't actually a nation of gamblers. So if you look at the data about how many people gamble, it's around half of us have gambled in the past year. And then if you look at how many people who have gambled on something other than the national lottery, it's it's lower still. And then if you look at how many people do it as a, on a regular basis, it's a lower fraction again. So that's important, I think, to bear in mind, particularly when you see narratives that are being spoken about in terms of, well, if you're a new Tory red wall, MP, you need to be uh, concerned about alienating your electorate. You know, the people who actually, when we're focusing on some of the gambling reforms, who would actually be impacted on this are a minority of a minority of, your, of those people. And I think it's really important to bear that in mind because often we talk about this in kind of population terms and you see people talking about, oh, why should the vast majority of us be impinged because of the tiny minority who can't control themselves? You need to flip that narrative round because actually it's only a tiny minority of people who are those very, very regular gamblers who do generate, as Ian said, a vast amount of wealth for the gambling industry who would actually potentially be impacted by some of the reforms that are being proposed. So I think that's very important to keep, uh, keep in our minds. The other thing that we've seen, certainly from some of the work that I've been doing with regular online sports bettors, and we've been looking at how their behaviours have changed during the COVID pandemic, is we asked them, you know, how did they, did they agree or disagree that they felt that the gambling industry could do more and should do more to protect them from harms? And overwhelmingly, over 60% of people, and these are the regular sports bettors, who the people who actually engage in this activity said that they would like gambling companies to do more to protect them from harms. And there was no north-south divide. That was pretty much the same across, uh, across the, full, um, the full geographic extent. So you know, there is a mandate to support change 
for the people who are actually engaging in these activities. So that's just a bit of background context about some of the numbers. Um, what I want to move on to now is just some reasons as to why I think it's important that we do um, look at a reform agenda and we do think carefully about these issues. So if we were to look at um, the experience of problematic gambling and area deprivation, we can see there is an exceptionally strong pattern of inequalities across those who live in the least deprived areas and those who lived in the most deprived areas. Now, if you live in one of the most deprived areas in England, you are seven times more likely to experience problematic gambling than if you live in the least deprived areas. That is a substantial pattern. Now, as you can see, I've got the percentages on this chart. And just to head off any kind of um, criticism that people might have that, well, we're still only talking about a minority of people, that tiny minority that I do see um, repeated time and time again. Okay. Again, let's concentrate on who these people are. These people who are uh, problematic gamblers are, um, it's not one in a hundred, because let's not forget, half of the population don't gamble. Actually, Again, there is a minority, again, of the people who take part in the kind of activities that we know have a stronger relationship with harm. Now, as Ian and others have said, you know, there is evidence that shows that actually up to about one in four people can be harmed from taking part in certain gambling activities. Again, these are, to my mind, substantial uh, minorities of people that we ought to be concerned about. But that is only part of the picture, because what we do know is that for everybody who is experiencing gambling harms, they affect on average about six other people. Now it's quite difficult to then manifest that into what that means in population terms, but I thought I would give it a go um, as I think it's important for us to start thinking about some of these numbers. So what you can do is between those who are in the least deprived areas and the most deprived areas, you could take a notional 100,000 people living in those spaces and those living in the least deprived areas, when you take into account how many we estimate to be experiencing gambling problems and how many people you then estimate to be experiencing additional harms because of that, we, we would then say around 1,400 people per 100,000 in the least deprived areas would be experiencing um, some kind of gambling harm. When you look at that for the most deprived areas, the figure is 9,800 just under 10,000 uh, um, 10, people per 100,000. Um, now that's because there is obviously a multiplier effect. You have more people who are problematic gamblers in their area, they're affecting more people. You get into bigger numbers. And again, it's addressing this issue that this is a tiny minority of people. Now for me, what that means is um, that, so sorry, I, I, and just again to say that these figures are seven times higher so I don't think these figures should be taken lightly. I don't think the health inequality that we see in this data should be taken lightly. And I do think we have to start asking some serious questions about what is the role potentially of gambling in maybe exacerbating inequalities in some of these areas. And equally, I think it should, everyone should be concerned. I think government should be concerned that the burden of harm is falling on communities um, who are least well equipped to, uh, to bear it. So to my mind, that's why I think we need to have a mandate to start considering um, change of reform and to try and improve health and well-being for the better. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much for that. Just, oh, well, sorry, the slide's gone there. I was, no. I just, no, no, I was you, looking at the, your, your last slide there on the affected others, mm. um, I'm just checking in, in my... 9,800 9, people out of 100,000. In my old trade journalism, we, we, would have said, we would have said one in 10. Yes, yeah. 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 Um, just, just checking, I understood the numbers properly. Thank you. Uh, more numbers coming up, I think, um, of a different sort from Carl Schoben of Salvation. Carl. Okay, thanks. And I'll, I'll try and give you as few numbers as possible, but I, just to make a wider point, thanks, in about um, some of the political dimensions of, of this issue. Um, so from April 2020, I and my company, Servation, a polling company, carried out tracking research into ag gambling attitudes amongst the general population and, and full disclosure, that was for the 
clean up gambling campaign. Um, so just a kind of very broad point, first of all, is there are very few issues that we poll where you get, you know, something like a 70 30 split for and against um e even higher with some of these issues and you know more funding for the nhs is one of them scrapped hospital car parking charges is another um yes. like the vaccine the current vaccination campaign is another and end gambling advertising promotion to children is another and introducing <laughs> state limits for online gambling is another and it, it, you know it is extremely rare that you get such large splits now in order to make sure that there were no significant variations across regions demographics and political leanings we also looked at larger sample sizes um, and attitudes in what we call the red wall so in our terms in the north and midlands and, and to look at it across political lines, we also examined Remain and Leave voters um, slightly to look at this sort of, again, this culture issue that people have talked about. Is this called kind of metropolitan elite trying to spoil the fun of working class people? Um, so for each of these larger subsamples, we applied the following three attitude questions. One of them was to protect consumers. There should be affordability checks for those who want to bet more than £100 a month. One of them was all gambling, advertising and promotion and sponsorship should be banned. Um, and another was there is enough money in football that no club should ever have to rely on gambling sponsorship. So for the first on affordability checks for those who want to bet more than £100 a month, nationally... So a national representative sample that split 72% in favour against 10% against. In the Midlands, that was 72 to 9. In the North, 69 to 12. Um, and Remain and Leave voters split pretty much exactly the same, 73 to 9. Um, 72 to 12. So for that question, there's absolutely no statistical difference between a national sample across all classes, areas, demographics, political leanings, and people in what we would call the red wall areas. Um, now, where, where you talk about more prohibitive measures, so that would be like a total ban on online gambling, for example. The split is much more 50-50. Even for a total ban on online gambling, generally more people are opposed to that than are in favour. Um, the question, all gambling, advertising, promotion and sponsorship should be banned. That is a more prohibitive question than some of the others. And that but still, it's 52% think it should be totally banned advertising, 21% think it shouldn't be. So it's still, you know, there's quite a lot of don't knows in there as well. And like the first question, there is no difference statistically in different regions and areas and political leanings in the country. Um, with there is enough money in football that no club should have to rely on gambling sponsorship, Nationally, 67% agreed with that, 9% disagreed. Um, no differentiation across regional areas and political leanings. Um, we also polled MPs, so just kind of very quickly in January, February 21, and we again found very similar attitudes towards gambling reform as the general, as the general public. When broken down by party, we found Conservative MPs slightly less in favour of stricter restrictions than Conservative voters. And we found Labour MPs slightly more in favour of gambling restrictions than Labour voters. However, overall, there is consistent support across the board. 70% of Conservative MPs agree people should be protected from losing more than they can afford. That's 92% of Labour MPs. 64% of Conservative MPs agree the gambling industry needs greater regulation. That's 92% of Labour MPs. 
Um, and there was more of a divide on the question of greater restrictions on gambling advertising. On this, 43% of Conservative MPs agree, 34% disagreeing, and 76% of Labour MPs agree with 30% disagreeing. So there is a slight, well, kind of Conservative MPs, a slight difference between MPs and um, the voters, but not, but not that much. So, so finally, do people care? OK, so anyone can produce misleading polling by not just testing attitude, but, all, but, 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 but the salient. So do but how much do people actually care about this? Um, now, I can't say for sure because we haven't done that much research into it. And, and we would you know, like to do more research in the future on the salience of this issue. But I don't know how many people watch EastEnders. Um, here, but last year there was a storyline with Kush, um, who was a very popular character, is no longer in it, and he became addicted to online casino gambling. Um, and his, his life fell apart. He started, you know, he gambled his house, and his family became homeless. Um, about 36% of the population watch EastEnders in some respect so that's that's a lot a lot of people so it's very influential um and 57 percent of people who were aware of the storyline said that it made them more in favor of stricter limits on online gambling um so i think i'll, I'll just leave you with that so it's there, there is no regional divide there is no demographic divide there is no political divide um people overwhelmingly want stricter regulations they don't want prohibition of any sorts um and when people are made w more aware of the issues they are become more in favor of stricter regulations not less thank you thank you very much, Carl. Um, I'm tempted to poll the audience, ask, ask how many EastEnders watches we have here, just to, but I, I suspect I'd, pr I'd just prove that sort of people who go to party conference are not in any way representative of the wider public. So, <laughs> so I shan't. On, and, and on your the policy interventions you listed and polled on there, I should point, point out that I, the, the £100 affordability of as, as Ian said earlier on, is something proposed by uh, my SMF colleague James Noyes in a report. The, some of the others you mentioned, are, are, they're, they're not things we have taken in. Uh, you, you take, you take a position on. Um, so I'm now going to, uh, we've had, thank you for all, all of you for those contributions. I'm going to go to uh, the audience now, but I, 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 I'm, even, I'm going to pretend, I know, I, know what, I know where the first question is coming from, because this, this is slightly contrived. Um, uh, yeah, but I'm going to go, if that's all right, to Henrietta Bowden-Jones um, uh, for, uh, yeah, for a question, since she alerted me before before the session due to the fact that she, she'd like to ask a question. So, oh. and then, then, we'll, then we'll come to... Thank come you to very it. much, James. Um, and also, uh, also, if you, if you could possibly tell us, you know, and this applies to everybody, if you could tell us all who, who you are as well. And, uh, and, yes, and um, I'm the director of the first ever NHS clinic to treat gambling disorder. I set it up in 2008, and uh, I've been running it ever since. We now have worked with NHS England, we have 15 more clinics either already existing or in development, and I advise House of Lords, APPG, NHS and all that um, in terms of gambling harm, um, as well as gambling treatment. Uh, I, I, yes, I was invited to just give a couple of thoughts in terms of a frontline worker uh, with lots of people behind me uh, in relation to what we feel would be helpful. And I'm pleased to say we agree with everything the panel has said today. So I've just got four things really to say. Uh, Self-regulation is not a viable option. We absolutely must get away from that in the gambling review. We have seen it fail repeatedly. Uh, offshore unregulated sites, these need to stop being able to be accessed in the UK. Uh, I, I cannot tell you how many of our people end up there because the self-exclusion works for them, then they go to an unregulated site. Uh, we need greater power to local councils. Very important for them to deem how many bookmakers they want on their high streets or other forms of gambling. We need affordability checks. We need an ombudsman. And lastly, and very importantly, we need a statutory levy to be able to apportion the funds that are needed to give us the correct methodology in order to know exactly what harm this country is suffering from and where. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Hannah. And I think there's some, some points of agreement between your points and the, uh, the panel there, but I think there's some, some things we haven't discussed, including the things like the statutory levy. So I wonder if I can get any thoughts um, primarily from our, our policymakers, uh, yeah, Ian and Richard, on, on that point. And uh, any, other, any other points that Henry has raised that you want to come in on? Enjoy it. Yeah, well, I, um, <clears throat> I agree with obviously everything that Henriette has done. She does, uh, by the way, some people may not realize, phenomenal work here uh, and often not well advertised. But the reality is that the work that you do saves lives and that has to be a phenomenal good. Um, yeah, I do. I think that um, I think that a statutory levy is absolutely required because um, uh, we need to finance a lot of this work. Uh, in catching those who have fallen through the net and also with the families. And I made reference to a meeting we had the other day to families whose family members have committed suicide in, uh, in the recent past and the devastation that has caused. And the stories were almost exactly the same, um, uh, how this had happened behind closed doors and had accelerated and the families knew nothing at all about this, but the industry itself did nothing to do the checks and everything else. And so to be able to afford that, Absolutely no question, there needs to be a statutory levy, I'm afraid, and uh, the sooner it's done, the better. Um, Richard? I just wanted to comment on what, something that Ian just said there, and actually um, probably something that Henrietta has also found, uh, is that sometimes, it, certainly in constituency cases I've had, the first, um, the first touching base on this often isn't from the people who are the addicts themselves. Uh, often it's, it comes in a quite a roundabout way. So um, one of the first interactions I had on this was a, a constituent of mine. Uh, his parents, uh, his parents got in touch with me because they'd been, they were, they were worried about losing access to their granddaughter um, because the relationship between their son and uh, his wife had broken down because of his gambling problem, and they bailed him out multiple times, and and then they were in this horrific situation of. Essentially, you know, you know, they love their son. They want to see their granddaughter. The amount of harm that had caused, and I think that sort of reflects a little bit of what Heather was saying in terms of the impact this has spreads out. It's not just on one person, and also just pick on upon a little bit on what Ian said that behind the closed doors nature of it. It's it's a, a sort of, because you can because you can do it from your mobile phone because you don't have to go somewhere to do very high stakes gambling. Um, you know, you can have casino games on your phone and, and lose thousands of unlimited amounts of money. It's very easy for nobody to notice. Uh, it's not like, uh, it, well, you know, people will try and hide other addictions, but it's, it's easier to hide a gambling addiction. So it's often quite very, very serious by the time anybody actually gets to it. Um, I think another aspect of this, which is another of the reasons we need to look at it and look at regulation. Can I just come back? Sorry, I, I wasn't going to answer. I really I should have explained why a statutory levy. The problem is right now you do have gambling companies that put money towards what they call dealing with these harms. The problem you have there is that uh, there is always a deep suspicion, often borne out by some of the uh, work that some of them do, which is the influence that they bring to bear on what they don't want done and what they do want done. So while it remains in that state, you actually open the problems for organizations like Henrietta's and others, uh, because the work that they're doing isn't much liked by some of the gambling industry. So you need, the reason why you don't make it statutory is it becomes anonymous in this sense. And therefore it is aimed at all those who are trying to prevent and help with harms. And that's why a statutory position is necessary to take the influence of the gambling industry out of what happens uh, post hoc, as it were. So that's. Can I, I just add a really yes, quick additional do. thought there, and, and absolutely agree about the need for a statutory levy um, because of the independence uh, that we need to get into the system. But it's also the quantum of funding we need to get into the system. Yeah. We do not have enough money to both research, prevent and treat yeah. the range of gambling harms that we see in Great Britain. And if anybody wants to come and talk to me about how difficult it has been to try and carve out a career as a gambling researcher over the past 15 years and sustain it, I can, I can talk to you at length about the difficulties and challenges that you face in doing that. But it also means that we have a very slim and particular focus on our evidence base. 
which then creates challenges when you are doing this kind of gambling act review. And that is something that I've seen much more recently, certain elements of the industry starting to say, oh, well, we don't have the evidence, therefore we can't take action. Now, that's because of systematic underinvestment in this issue by successive governments going on for at least 15 years. Now, that situation has to change. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, the, the lady in the red dress, or orange dress, excuse me, um, caught my eye and then the gentleman in, in front of her. Um, and later on, I may, uh, in a technological innovation, I may bring in a question from something called Slido, because our, our online audience are also participating. So that may be, that may be beyond me, but I'll do my best. So. Uh, thank you. My name is Hannah David. Um, Heather, thank you very much for your points. Just to before I get on to my two questions, um, you talked about the evidence isn't there. I think part of the problem with evidence gathering is that it is a secret addiction um, and often you don't know and people don't want to come forward. Um, so I think that is a problem with the evidence gathering on this. Um, just moving over to my two questions, um, Heather, you showed us how the burden of harm disproportionately falls on those who are least able to deal with it. And Ian, you talked about the importance of the role of regulation in managing harm. Um, but I would say that you can't regulate out the harm caused by addiction. Addicts will find a way. They'll find a way around the systems. Therefore, surely the availability of treatment to address harm from addiction must be a government priority. Um, so what can and should be done to ensure that treatment is there available and accessible? And my second question is, where are we actually with the gambling review at the moment? Right, yes. The first may be easier to answer than the second, I guess. Um, but um, if you want to go first on the question of how to, yeah, how to deliver more, more and better, how to deliver more, more and better treatment, um, uh, well, let me just widen this slightly because um, for some time, uh, when we set up the Centre for Social Justice many years ago, one of the areas was um, uh, addictions uh, as one of the pathways into poverty and deprivation. And at that time, when we were looking at it, it was mostly illegal drug addiction. We then widened that out into alcohol addiction. And now we've got gambling in there as well. And so, um, if you'll forgive me for a second, but the th the theme of this, how do you how do you get the treatment, is the same throughout. And I have to say, successive governments have still not completely grasped the nature of the need for rehabilitative treatment uh, to take place. There is some, but what we've seen in the past few years, going you know, over actually a large number of years, even back to the last Labour government has been the collapse in certain areas of treatment for those other well-known addictions. Alcohol has been with us and addiction has been with us for hundreds of years. And, uh, you know, there's been essentially treatment for this. But it, it's, it's again, uh, a poor one. But gambling is fairly new in this arena. And so we have an opportunity now to uh, rediscover that process. So it's really important, that, <coughs> I think, in the review, A, that the money is provided, uh, and B, that therefore there are proper treatments set up that are independent. And that is very much down to what has to happen within this process. The government has an opportunity now uh, to re-establish the whole idea of treating conditions like this. As I say, it goes on a wider front, not just gambling, uh, but you know, across the board in these areas. It's been very tough for many of them who deal with rehabilitation and treatment to operate. So we're now, you know, gambling could set, show the way again about how we do this. And I think it's very important we do because we have to rescue people. Thank you. Thank you. Richard, any thoughts on whether the gambling? Well, I think obviously we've seen some, we've seen some big changes in the, uh, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport recently. Um, the Immigration Minister, Chris Philp, has now moved over to, I think, be looking over all of this. <laughs> um, I'm, I think we're all hopeful that it's going to be Something that's brought forward pretty soon. Mm. I think there's. I think that one of the really interesting things about the entire review period, though, actually has been the extra evidence that keeps coming forwards. And there's been that great House of Lords review. I'd actually think there's a head of steam in Parliament, which has built up over the last few years on this. Um, and I and I think that's been particularly helpful. And it is um, it is properly cross party as well. In a way, I, I think sometimes these issues have been sort of sidelined a bit, but. I think given the impact that this has had on so many people and, and their constituents um, and when and when MPs get those get those individual constituency cases, they can see the, the widespread nature of it. And just to uh, come on to uh, Hannah's um, question essentially about treatment, I think that's going to have that's got to be absolutely part of it. 
I think um, it was having Nadine Doris as uh, public health minister was actually quite helpful in this. And now she's heading up the um, DCMS. I think she will help bring that uh, public health aspect to it mm -hmm. and, to, to, and to treatment, which I think is a is a good thing uh, for the review as well to have that uh, at least playing into it in some degree. Thank you. Don't, don't my head come out. Well, do, do feel free to shout. Oh, no, 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 sorry, the, mic, the mic's coming. The mic's coming. Thank you, and uh, thank you to the panel. Um, a question for uh, sorry, my name is David Williams. I work for the Rank Group and um, Casino Land Based Casinos, Land Based Bingo, uh, and Online Gambling. Um, Sir Ian, I, I was I was very interested to hear your interview on Tory Radio. I think it was uh, last year. Um, I also did a uh, an interview, and uh, we found quite a lot of common ground uh, as it as it transpired. Uh, I remember you were very keen to step away, and I think Richard mentioned it uh, again today, and you both mentioned it today to step away from this sort of label of being a prohibitionist, uh, which is um, sometimes banded around. And it prompts me. Uh, to ask you, Sir Ian and, and Richard, you, and Richard, you talked about sort of destination venues. Whether you um, consider there is still a place in our community, something that James mentioned in heads up, in our communities for those destination venues like bingo clubs uh, and casinos, uh, whether they still have a role. Do you want me to go first? Yeah. Um, there are two things. First of all, as I said earlier on, we're not opposed to. Uh, gamble uh, providing at the end of the day obviously it doesn't lead to difficulties and, and the and the way in which some of the gambling companies have uh, have targeted individuals and brought them in who are already suffering um, and bring them into further and further and deeper gambling the one thing you can say the advantage of of um, of the non-online let us say physical venues you, I, you it can be argued that uh, if properly run they have a they have they should have a capacity to spot immediately somebody who is in <coughs> issues and got issues and problems and is gambling too much because they're physically there as it were uh, now we know of some casinos that uh, have a very strong policy of doing this uh, and um i've been to visit them as well with carolyn actually too where they're able to say that you know we immediately start ringing alarm bells at certain points when some people are gambling not to know where their income's coming from those checks uh, so, it, you know, the, the point is we're not here to stop it. We're here to make sure that it is ultimately done in a way that allows us to ensure that nobody is allowed to go down that vortex of, uh, of excessive gambling to the point where they're unable to cope. That's the critical bit. So if the industry, the, the physical industry, as it were, as opposed to the online industry, can demonstrate categorically that those checks are in place and they should be in place and they should be required by the review, by the way, absolutely categorically, uh, that these checks are in place and that there is support immediately and also really a realization across the industry that somebody can't move from one certain site to another to another etc just to carry on that this has to be shared information something we have to deal with on the um, uh, general data protection rules which uh, start that but I think that's important uh, then there is a place for that uh, providing people wish still to gamble but my concern is these checks absolutely have to be in place and we do come across sites that don't do this and that are quietly just turn a blind eye because people will gamble and they don't bother. So it has to be best practice and thoroughly checked uh, in that case, definitely. But it is, it is you know, as we were saying earlier on, the online world is about fast, speed, immediate, you know, constantly doing it now, 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 now. The advantage, I suppose, of a place where somebody is physically there and seen to be gambling, that they can intervene, but you must have policies to intervene uh, when this becomes clear and obvious, and that I'm afraid that data needs to be shared. Thank you. Um, Might I? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. No, you, you Sorry. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, just to say, I think it's really important that you've raised that question because we shouldn't lose focus on the land based venues. Everything at the moment is very much focused on online because. Mm. We went through the fob tees debate and then there was a sense that action was taken there and therefore that's land based dealt with and now let's move on to online now there are really important issues with online but when it comes to land base as well when we're talking about the kinds of things that ian's just been talking about the question that you asked we also just need to also consider what's the composition of the type of the products that are available in lots of different venues so a bingo hall that is primarily focused on bingo is potentially something that well, might have a lower level of risk 
um, amongst its populace, a bingo hall that has a lot and lot and lot of machines and is pushing those machines and has tablets, yep. gives you more cause for concern. So we also need to just bring the issues around the particular products and the nature of the products that are available in those spaces and considering those and the level of harms that are associated with those two. Thank you. I'm really told you. You're actually going to get the last word because we're into our, our final minute of the session. Oh, sorry. Um, no, no, uh, no. I will look. I, I, as I, I'm, as I said before, you know, there's a destination. I think there's a destination and event based. I think that's and then you've got everything right through to your mobile phone, which you can use in the comfort of your own um, bedroom. Um, I think if you look at it in terms of, I, I view it a little bit like this. If I have a drink as part of a night out, then that's not a problem. If my whole life is dedicated to drinking, then that's a problem. Um, if I have a bet as part of a night out, then that's not that much of a problem, or a day at the races, uh, or a night at the bingo. Um, if my whole life is dedicated to gambling, then that's a bit of a, then it's a massive problem. The extra additional problem with gambling is that I can only have so many drinks before I'm so drunk, nobody's going to let me into another pub or serve me alcohol at an off license. That's not the same with gambling. Um, you can just go from one venue to venue, which is why I think what Ian said about the, the, the sharing information is, is there has to be some, that we have to look at that and see how, how that can be, how that can be done with, whilst also we get re, uh, protecting individual privacy. Um, I'm possibly uh, uh, an outlier in terms of the um, APPG because you know, the 2005 Gambling Act, the big debate there was around Super Casino. That's because that became the totemic thing, whereas actually the real issues were online and faulties on high streets. Um, I actually don't have a problem if Blackpool wants to have a Super Casino as part of a broader regeneration piece as a destination and sort of event-based sort of venue. I have a much greater concern around what I can do anywhere from my phone. Um, I think there are some aspects of, uh, there are definitely some aspects of physical venues, as Heather said, you know, when the bingo halls are basically pushing spend per head, you know, as you'd expect them to do, and, you know, to push harder on, harder on slots or potentially on casino games. I think there's there's obviously elements, when does a bingo hall become a, become a casino or something different in that aspect? When does, one aspect will become secondary to the other. Um, similarly to online gambling, when does the sports betting just become a gateway actually for an operator into just running people down casino games? Um, but I think that's that's all part of the mix. Um, uh, and, you know, land-based, uh, one of the things I I am concerned about with some of the casinos is the, at the moment you have to have, you have to use cash. Essentially, you've got to draw out cash from a cash machine or you've got to draw out cash from a cash desk. Um, I know some of the casino operators would like to be able to do tap at the table. I think that that break is a is a is a useful natural break for people um, that they've got to physically go and get money out um, rather than it all being done on card. Um, I think if you want to go down that line, then why would casinos be regulated any differently from online card with state limits? I think casino gambling is for casinos. Um, but there are special regulations which go into casinos in order to enable that break. If they want to become online gambling places in a physical presence, then that's a different thing. But that's my sort of view on it. Thank you very much. Um, we are now um, a couple of minutes past the, the allotted hour of finishing, so I'm going to wind things up there by uh, thanking you all very much for coming and inviting you to give a hand of thanks to our panel for all of their contributions and thoughts. Thank you all very much.